is Saturday, the 14th of October 2017, and you're listening to Skeptics with a K, the podcast for science, reason, and critical thinking. I am your host, Mike Hall. With me today is Marsh. Hello. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much. And Alice. <laughs> Slightly bigger cheer for bigger Alice cheer there, for Alice, I yeah. feel, I've pointed early on. Fine. Bigger cheer, they, they cheer in proportion to the level of qualification. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got no you cheer. You got no cheer, that's fine. <laughs> you got a mediocre cheer. Yeah, you got like six GCSEs worth of uh, <laughs> cheer there, that's fine. Twelve, exactly. twelve, steady well, on, okay. twelve. Okay, so... Uh, it's a difficult show to start off because normally we start off with, you know, what have you guys been doing? But I can say to Marsh what you've been doing, and the answer is QED. Yes, yeah, so I look around. Because we've, been, been, quite, look we've around. been quite busy. This stuff, basically. We're yes. going to save some funny anecdotes um, to do on this show for interesting things that have happened, but no, nothing got nothing. Funny's happened. Nothing um, funny's happened. It's just so, been a, a very admin heavy couple of weeks. So, should we do the chocolate? Yes. Should we do the chocolate? Right, so last episode we asked people to give us some chocolate and sweets and crisps and so on and so forth. And lots of people have delivered and we've got it hidden under the... Well, should we bring out no. these ones first? So do you want to bring out... Of things. We have these ones here. This is from, uh, from Michael Somebody Valkenberg, wasn't it? Room? Where is Michael Valkenberg? He's brought them and fucked off. That's not a good sign. Oh, God. What are we going to do? Do we eat these? I don't know. This is not... A, this is not, not we easy. have these all the way from Israel, uh, these chocolates and uh, various sweets. These ones are all written on in Hebrew. There is a cheat sheet, but I'm going to hide the cheat sheet, so we'll not have no idea what these are oh, yeah. until after until after we eat them. Because uh, that's the only way that this is any, in any way entertaining. So these are... They look a bit like what's it? They've got a baby playing football on the front. I mean, I'm well up for what's it? <laughs> it is a baby playing football. I'm so well good. up for what's it? With a little ginger curl on the front. A little ginger of, curl. Um, so that's not bad. It's pretty good. And uh, what else have you got there, Alice? Um, we've got some things called. Well, they're being referred to as death candy um, from oh, Finland. Wow. So, said by Veku in Finland, who isn't even here, but sent these to the post, them, uh, posted some death candy in, to us. So including this is a, a lovely little like postcard from Finland, which has got like cow, a cow and a duck and a car on it. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Classic Finnish stuff. Classic. <laughs> you say Finland, people think of cows, ducks and cars. Nothing else beyond I've, that. I've also brought some Caramex. Obviously. You Obviously. Some Caramex. <laughs> international unit of um, sugar. Which is the international uh, standard unit of sugar. So does anyone want a Caramex? Yeah. We, can, we can, we can, I can, I should have had a Caramac cannon. You could have, <laughs> I would have a Caramac catapult. That's sort of trebuchet. can fire them out into the crowd. That would be, that would be, that would be brilliant. Can you throw them in? Is this a health and safety violation? I don't violation? think it's I don't a good think idea I can to throw, throw them. them. But what we can do is we can give Caramacs out at the end. I think yeah. you can throw them like Willy Wonka. I want people eating Caramacs in, we want proper like Willy Wonka. Is, who here can definitely catch and won't <laughs> sue us? Can can catch okay. <laughs> so the fact that you have your hand up, that's a contractual agreement that you won't sue us. <laughs> Because if you don't catch this and hurt yourself, you can sue us for hurting you, and we can sue you for being a liar. Uh, it'll balance out at that point. Do you want to throw some? Can, I, can, I, can I point out that Chris had his hand up for who can catch? <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's see how well Jackson the guide dog is trained at this point. That would be incredible. Tom, uh, I'm a, have a caramac, mate. Anyone else want a caramac? Well, you guys oh, and then, uh, should we try the death candy? Let's try, let's, the, death let's candy. try the death candy. Let's try the death candy. And then we'll do, then we'll do some actual skeptics. Then, we'll, then we'll do a story. Yeah, yeah. And then we can, we can like, open into things, as we, things as we go. I'm not sure about that sesame stuff, Oops, though. That is sesame brick dust. Yeah, that's oh, proper God. terrible. That's that's fucking up. This looks a bit like licorice. So like... this is the finished death candy. Oh. It's in a worryingly pill-shaped form. <laughs> it smells really interesting. Does it smell of cyanide? Is it almond? That's not a cyanide. It's, oh God, it's, it's it smells like licorice to me. Do you think it's, it's licorice? Just, it Are we going for it? Oh, it's crunchy. Oh, this is not what I expected. It's like a fruit pasta, not fruit pasta, like a fruit thingy, fruit wine gum. gum. A wine gum. A wine Ew. gum. Oh, God, it's fizzy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 what is this? Okay. Vaku is not in this room. This will go out. Vaku, I hate you. This is not <laughs> an experience. Yeah, this is really all. horrible. It tastes, it's kind of salty. It is salty. It's I weirdly it salty. Around. Does anyone try the death candy? I don't mind passing yeah. these around as well. Everyone wants to go with the death candy. Okay, Jesus let's Christ, Christ, can a volunteer, Tammy, can you pass some? Can you do death candy for people? I don't know why people would do this for pleasure. No. I mean, listening to this show, to be honest. That's <laughs> what I was talking about there. Okay. Right. Should we, should well, we start we'll the show properly now? We'll let's start doing some stories. Should we start doing some scepticism then? Marsh, tell us something interesting about the world. Okay, so... I tend to accept pretty much anybody on Facebook. And many of you here are probably friends with me on Facebook. Um, I've done that as long as we've been running the Murderstown Skeptic Society. 
And most of that, I think, is because um, I like to communicate with listeners and you know have a sense of community, that kind of thing. Um, it's partly because I don't want really to use Facebook in a purely personal capacity, but primarily it's because I run the group with Mike. And Mike is weird and doesn't like to talk to people. I don't add anyone on Facebook. And I have to overcompensate because you refuse to talk to strangers. Mm. You took that stranger danger (laughs) message to heart at a very very young age. And you lived your life by that. That's your mantra to live by. Usually it's not a problem at all. But sometimes it leads to some slightly odd insights into something I wouldn't have otherwise spotted. So take, for instance, um, a post that leapt out to me recently, which was shared on Facebook by a friend whose name I can't really uh, remember. And I don't recall ever having seen this person's name before either. It was titled, The Effects of Wireless Devices on Human Body. In the image, with the post... (laughs) On human body. On human human body. body. Not on a human body. Not on the human body. Not on the human body. Not on your human body. Not on their human body. Just on human body. On human body. (laughs) And the image that accompanied the post was this one here. Okay? You don't need to see the full details of this, but anyone who can't see it, it's a pie chart. It's entitled, Can Wireless Radiation Affect on Human Body? (laughs) (laughs) And what we see is a little red sliver, which is marked as 1%, labelled no... And then the rest of it is a blue 99% labelled yes. Yes, wireless radiation effect on the human body. (laughs) Um, So I thought maybe my Facebook friend, they'd shared it because it was bollocks and they were sort of saying, look at this ridiculous thing over here. But they just commented saying, very interesting read and quite disturbing. So I thought, blimey, what actually is this? You know, my interest was piqued. Either this is genuinely something new and disturbing science that I hadn't kind of seen before and was being done uh, and new, or my Facebook contact, whoever they were, were completely off base. So I looked into it. This link was uh, to a, a paper published in the Journal of Computer Science and System Biology, which sounds pretty solid title. I think that's kind of this is what I would expect research on wireless to, to, to be done in. Computer science, systems biology sounds solid. Flicking through it, there were some other graphs which had some pretty astounding findings in there, um, showing, for example, that apparently wireless devices uh, were overwhelmingly to blame for brain tumours and hearing issues. And so this was the graph that proved that. So you can see here, we see uh, diseases due to the wireless devices, brain tumours, 86% it is there, uh, I think it is, 84% and then 82% of uh, hearing loss, and we have some others here, uh, like male infertility, apparently 36%. Of what? No idea, 36% of your infertility, I have no idea, but apparently these are the findings. So at a glance, it could seem like pretty scary stuff, you know, very interesting read, quite disturbing. But obviously the devil is in the detail. This is a peer-reviewed study. Um, Even I could spot issues with it, though. I don't read a lot of studies. I tend to leave that to you guys. You know the science kind of side of things an awful lot more. With your 12 GCSEs. With your 12 GCSEs (laughs) and a PhD. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I tend not to. But um, let's see, Alice, looking through the introduction first, you read a lot of these papers. What would you expect to see in the introduction to a science paper? Introduction should be the background to what you're researching, why you're researching it, um, a little bit about what's generally known, but not too in depth. Um, yeah. Just general background about the topic and why you know why you're going to study it, what's important about it, and and then to lead into to your study in particular. Okay, so this this was their introduction in the context of that explanation of what introduction should be. Their introduction was. Nowadays, the using of wireless devices increased day by day because these devices do not use the physical cable that is for the purpose of communication. These devices use electromagnetic radiation for receive and send data through air. Either it is sound data or network data. These devices emit harmful radiations and are affected on human body because such radiations are present everywhere that we cannot feel nor see. It says wireless devices emit harmful radiations that cause many diseases i.e. male infertility, miscarriage risk, brain tumour, uh, ear hearing impairment, effect on the fetus increasing risk of cancer. Other kind of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's like the, uh, the, the look of the ear. It impairs the way your ear look. It deforms your ear, but you hear absolutely fine. You just look like a bit of a dick. Uh, it could be that. Um, Parkinson's disease, says Alzheimer's, heart disease. It carries on asthma, insomnia, leukemia, high blood pressure, birth defects, rheumatoid arthritis, immune system. Re- radiations are also... <laughs> it causes immune system. It causes immune system. system. <laughs> <laughs> radiations are also cause of some symptoms, which are fatigue, sleep disturbance, headache, etc. So they didn't... This was me. <laughs> now, for me, that's all supposition. That's not introduction. That is conclusion. That's what their paper... They think yeah. their paper's finding, to say that radiation causes all these things. So they've just gone straight in and made their initial... Unless they're... Ref- if, if they're referencing those things they might be saying this is what is known already and no, they weren't referencing them there was no I, references I didn't to think any, they any would of be. that so that's bad enough then you've got the literature review the uh, literature review uh, alice what's a literature review section of a paper for 
You don't get them in many papers, but it's, it's, it is usually, it's a review of what is currently known. It's looking at papers that have already come before your study and going in depth into what that means and putting together a real uh, picture of the current knowledge rather than just, whereas most papers will be one thing in an individual setting, to put all of those papers together into one big picture context and talk about that in the literature review. Okay, bear that in mind. Here's their literature review. Male infertility. Nowadays, a cell phone is being kept very close to the groin area by human. <laughs> specifically, specifically, the sentence says, nowadays a cell phone is being kept very close to the groin area by human, like near the testis, uh, <laughs> such as trouser pocket, is commonly used for carrying a mobile phone. I like the fact that they put like, like in there, like, yeah, like around there, very scientific. These radiations can cause changes in shapes, motility, and number of sperms. <laughs> you love the word sperms, don't you? I love pluralising sperm to sperms. I never thought I'd see it in a peer review paper, paper, but it's right there. Uh, radiations from cell phone can harm to the structure and function of testis and decrease male fertility. The radio frequency of uh, Wi-Fi has harmful effects on semen. Exposure of human sperms to Wi-Fi internet connected with laptop, with laptop causes decreased motility and increase the DNA fragmentation due to the non-thermal effect. No uh, review, no uh, references to any of that. That is just again uh, all a conclusion. A literature review should be reference dense. It yeah. should be full of references. You're that talking didn't about the le- any literature. literature. So this is the level of science that we're talking about here. Um, this, you know, th- there's no reference for any of these statements, which is weird, be- weird because the claims that are being made in that whole section are very specific. So if you're going to make specific claims in a literature review, you'd think you'd be able to point to where those claims came from. But no, this is just pure supposition. Then we have the methodology of the study, a study which is claimed to show 99% accuracy that wireless signals uh, can harm the human body. Uh, we see, uh, as we see right there, that, that produced this graph. The section is titled uh, Survey and Methodology. And it says, the study is based on the theoretical approach and survey for collecting results from several medical doctors. The survey questionnaire was was, uh, interviewing for data collection uh, doctors and other paramedical staff uh, from the city hospital in Kaipo, the city hospital in uh, the civil hospital in Kaipo and a couple of other hospitals. It says a questionnaire was designed for conducting the interview. It contained 15 questions which cover sufficient information about wireless devices that affect human health and raise diseases. The other questions related to the number of people affected by wireless radiation. There were 300 questionnaires which were distributed in medical doctors uh, <laughs> of different diseases. I'm not sure how you distribute a questionnaire into, into a, a, doctor. a doctor. A lot of lube. A lot of lube. <laughs> a lot of lube. A lot of lube. I mean, the in is easy, the out is much harder, and then, <laughs> then interpreting that data is very difficult. It's not like, uh, yeah, it's a very inexact science. Um, uh, they say uh, they're uh, distributed to medical doctors of different diseases in different hospitals. Uh, in, in the results, each doctor is given their own ideas about the effects of wireless de- device on human body uh, based on their observation about patients. So this pie chart that's apparently very interesting and disturbing was actually showing that 99% of the 300 doctors from a couple of different hospitals in India uh, told a survey that they thought wireless signals were to blame for brain tumours. It doesn't actually do any science at all. It's like, do you reckon this is a bad thing? It's just an opinion poll, nothing more than that, in peer-reviewed literature. That's all of the science that was done here. And for me, the discussion in it as well couldn't be more dishonest with that in mind. They say, this study confirms that the harmful effects of radiation on the, of the, people, uh, on the body of people, uh, of the area selected for the study, as revealed by medical doctors. And it doesn't confirm that. It confirms, at best, the doctors that you asked, it confirms what they thought and nothing more than that. It doesn't actually do any real science. It's saying, what do you reckon? And people are just sort of picking stuff uh, out of the air. They say, in this way, our research has revealed that the prolonged use of such devices uh, at at a greater risk as the uh, harmful effects may cause permanent damages uh, which may not be repaired. So saying that the more you, that their study shows, the more you use these wireless devices, the more risk you're going to have because you can't repair the permanent damage doesn't say this in the slightest. The study doesn't even mention prolonged use compared to limited use. It says nothing about risk, let alone relative risk or long-term damage. Pretty much none of the words of that conclusion are in any way in the study or in the questioning. It's total conjecture by the people who wrote the study. Here's the first line of their conclusion. It is concluded that the use of wireless devices has been uh, increased throughout the world. These devices have become part of our life because many people are unaware about the effects of, on human health of using these devices. Again, no, that fucking isn't concluded at all. (laughs) This paper literally doesn't even mention anything about the increase in wireless devices or public awareness of health effects, and it doesn't measure the health effects that it thinks are happening. 
This is just activism and propaganda masquerading as academia. So obviously, I summarised some of these concerns about this study as a comment uh, on this Facebook article. Uh, so my Facebook friend wouldn't realize, uh, would realise that this isn't actual real research. And oddly enough, they just ignored my comments. And that's when I realised how I know this person, how I know this particular person. Because from time to time, when I'm trying to get guests on Be Reasonable, <laughs> the only contact I can find for them is on Facebook, and sometimes they add me. Uh, so I'm hereby amending my accept all Facebook friend request policy to exclude people I've tried to interview on Be Reasonable uh, from now on. That's a moratorium, no more of that. <laughs> Um, in previous shows, I have talked about numerous things. Like, you've done a science one. I'm not doing a science one this time. Um, yeah. I've talked about numerous things that women are encouraged to stick in their vaginas. <laughs> From magnetic, crystal, and light-emitting dildos, um, to the now infamous... That's, is that what LED stands for? <laughs> 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 To the now infamous uh, Yoni Egg, which, thanks to Mike secretly running Goop, um, <laughs> apparently, we have uh, a little example of... We have a legit jade egg. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can hold up for people to see. Yeah, that isn't that fun. About the size of a Cadbury's cream egg. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's... Is that... Do you measure all things by... <laughs> by <laughs> relative to other <laughs> British chocolate, yes. Sugar is measured by Caramax. Eggs are measured by cream egg. It's about the size of an actual egg, it, isn't it's, it? It's quite... No, it's smaller than an actual egg. Well, it depends on Small what laid egg. it, obviously. Yeah. There's it's some weight the size it. of a, It's, it's, it's quite weighty. weighty. Enjoy, enjoy the weight, Mike. Just in your hand is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it comes with, like, a little... Basically, a little bottle top. I guess it's a plinth for yeah, it to it's sit a, on. Yeah, it's a little, so let me... It's just, a very dramatic plinth. Oh, just oh, pop that there. That can sit there. Is that so you can recharge it in the moonlight? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Pop yeah. it on the little pouch, because they say you're supposed to put it on like a little Oh, satin you've got to keep it on the thing, otherwise... And it... then charge it in the moonlight, so we'll pop it on its, on its little pouch there. Nice. <laughs> it's it's not nice. quite jade-coloured. It's, it's kind of green, but it's a bit dark to be jade. It's a nice kind of muffled but... effect going on. Uh, we, could, some... we could pass it around if people want to feel the, the weight of the jade egg. It hasn't been Just... used. It is <laughs> clean. <laughs> <laughs> um, but despite the fact that there's a constant rebuttal about anything that is advertised for women to put up their vaginas, um, there are a constant stream of products designed exactly for this purpose. Um, so for this special episode, I thought I would do a rundown of five more things people are selling for vagina integration. Um, Is that the term, vag vagina integration? That's, that's the term I've given it. Okay, I like it. Um, so I have five things that uh, you can buy if you if you so choose to to put up your vagina. The first one is herbal tampons. Which uh, first hit my radar early last year when gynaecologist Dr. Jen Gunter wrote about them and it was picked up by IFL Science. Um, the articles were referring to a seller called Embrace Pangea, who were and still are selling a product called Yoni Detox Vaginal Pearls, a herbal vaginal detox cleanse. So on their website, they say that the womb is the sixth elimination organ. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's the other five? Can we get the first five? I have no idea what the other five are. Are they talking about eliminating toxins or like assassins, kind of organs? <laughs> I have no idea what the so other five, five are. So five other elimination it. organs. You're going to talk like kidney. Kidney, kidney liver, liver. liver. Other kidney. There's three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Lungs? Can you breathe out? Is it yeah, carbon? You do, yeah, yeah, yeah you breathe lungs, out carbon dioxide. That's yeah. four. Presumably colon. Yeah. Colon? I mean, that's going to count, isn't it? And yoni. And your name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Kidney, kidney, liver, colon. Your, it's like the start of Trumpton, this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a colon and your sounds like the next Disney film. <laughs> um, so they say on their website, some major imbalances that modern women experience on a daily basis are bacteria vaginosis, foul odour, yeast infections, endometriosis and fibroids. So these are little, like tiny little mesh pouches um, stuffed with herbs, including Mother's Worth, Angelica and Borneol, which they call pearls. Um, Is it like those things hipsters make tea in, where they get the little metal, it's like a little... And, they fit and they suspend it in the no, thing? No, it's made of fabric. 
It's fabric. It's fabric. It's a little. It's a tea bag. It is like a tea it's bag. A tea it's like a, tea a tea tiny bag. little tea bag. Yeah, oh yeah. god. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's made of it's made of fabric. It's the little white mesh pouches with with herbs stuffed inside and then tied at the top with a little. Well, it's a yoni tea bag. It's a yoni tea bag. Do they have guidance for how long you meant to leave it in? For how yes. Strong it gets? So um, <laughs> you, there is guidance on how long to leave oh, it right, in. Oh, of course there is. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when they were first advertising it, um, when Dr. Jen Gunter talked about it, they were recommending that you leave them in for three days. Whoa. Whoa. That's got to be a bad idea. Terrible idea. They now, since they received so much criticism after Dr. Dunn Gunter talked about it, um, they are now recommending 24 hours with at least a three-day gap between each, but you're supposed to use three per month. I mean, that's still going to overbrew your tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. Um, Do they tell you to, like, uh, hang them out on the washing line to get another use out of them? Like, uh, yeah, like someone from Coronation Street. Um, so they say they've changed the protocol for a gentler one for the well-being of their customers. Um, and for good reason, you really shouldn't leave mesh bags of herbs inside your vagina. It's not a good idea. If nothing else, it's really going to start to smell. Oh, God, yeah. They shouldn't the have bacteria. to change a thing for the well-being of their customers. You no, think that should just, be front and centre yeah. of what they're looking to do anyway. But yeah. all right, we've had so much criticism. We'll do something that's good for you guys and just uh, affirm the time you've got this <laughs> We'll We'll, we'll knock down the time. Shoved in, yeah. Um, they actually claim to treat bacterial growth with these things, but they're just a, they're going to be a breeding ground for, ground for bacteria. Does not mean treat as in give a reward to? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, have yourself a little bit of this bacteria. You've done some good work this month. I had a look on the website, um, and I don't recommend it. The testimonials make for some really gruesome reading. Um, there's some images um, which are really not nice to look at um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna read any of the testimonials now because it's not yet lunchtime um (laughs) but it involved words like sloughing and the removal of thick hardened skin what's sloughing is that sending people to slough slough off oh okay gotcha to slough off the skin So obviously this is incredibly damaging, um, which is exactly what Dr. Jen Gunn said in her post. So she said, these herbs um, could be damaging the lactobacilli, the good bacteria, or be directly irritating to the uh, vagina mucosa, the lining of the vagina. And both of these outcomes will increase your risk of infection. Um, And it's not just Embrace Pangea who sell these. Um, You can get them on eBay or Amazon. I tried to buy some. Um, I didn't have enough notice before doing the show to get them in time for the show. Um, But you can still buy them. You know, we've been planning QD for about seven months, right? Yeah, I know. But I didn't know what my story was going to be until like three days ago. So what you're saying is you were disorganised. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. I didn't blame (laughs) it. It's not like, oh yeah, I wasn't given enough notice to do the thing that I decided to do. to be fair, you didn't give me... You didn't actually ask me to do the podcast. That is true. (laughs) Just... We didn't check with you whether you wanted to do a live show. No, we just, we just, just assumed. Yeah, so that's fair enough. <laughs> so I didn't have that. I didn't really have any notice. I think but the first you knew is when we put the what? blog post out announcing it. No, it's when you announced it on the show. On air, we yes. announced it was on air. Yes. Okay. You said, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna do a live sketch through the cave." It's like, are we? I mean, I assumed, but but still, you might have asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Number two on the list um, is a bit more of a fun one that is not necessarily going to be super dangerous um, called Passion Dust. This is great. Um, It doesn't make any bold health claims, so it's a good start, but it's just downright bizarre. Um, A listener and a friend sent these to me a few months ago. Um, Their website is called Pretty Woman Inc. um, And they sell these things called Passion Dust. I-N-C or I-N-K? INC. Okay, it's not Pretty Woman Inc. It just <laughs> colours you in some way. Um, well, there is. There, there might okay. be some colouring involved. Um, so they're little capsules filled with glitter that you stick in your vagina, oh. where the coating dissolves. Oh. Uh, they recommend you have a hot shower just to encourage it to dissolve properly, but it should dissolve on its own anyway. Um, and uh, when it dissolves, it gives you what they like to call magicum. Oh, God. Oh, God, do they have to call it that? <laughs> well, face it, Marsh, you're a little bit proud of that as a pun. <laughs> I'm not even sure that's a pun. It doesn't work, is it? That's a just pun. like a, a grotesque Portland tour. <laughs> <laughs> I have standards, Mike. Uh, basically, it makes you sparkling. 
Um, this can last for several days, or knowing how tough it is to get rid of glitter, probably for the rest of eternity. Yes, um, yeah, completely. It adds a sweet flavour to the vagina, apparently. It's flavoured. It's, 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 well, they say, they distinctly say it is not flavoured, it doesn't have a specific flavour, it just makes you a little bit sweeter. That sounds like a flavour. <laughs> it's certainly a taste. It's a taste, yeah. Surely yes, it's going to be a bit a gritty as well, because glitter is quite gritty. So, so, so that's so they... not good. Is it going to exfoliate your tongue? <laughs> <laughs> so they do comment on this. Um, they point out that it can leave things a bit gritty. Um, they say they, they, they reckon it's fine on the woman because of the the slickness anyway like protects the glitter they they say it like basically wraps up the glitter right. so it's fine but they do say um if you're going to perform oral sex on your male partner we advise pleasing him first before he goes in not after <laughs> because of the grittiness gotcha they do say it's not like having a mouthful of sand though so that's okay I'm glad they have to put that on their side <laughs> when you have to put that as a caveat on your product don't sell that product um, but the main problem with, with the glittery capsules is the flavour the sweetness comes from sugar based uh, it's a sugar based sweetness so uh. they do say you know if you're allergic to anything with glycerin or sugar in it don't use them um, because it's, it is, it's got sugar in it and that again doesn't bode well for vaginas. This is what is going to give you infections. It is not a good idea to put anything sweet uh, in your vagina. But otherwise, possibly harmless. They've not tested. They d- distinctly say on their on yeah. their website, we've not done any testing. It's up to you if you want to use it. But <laughs> they do say they use like decent grade glitter. They point out <laughs> that um, beauty products that have glitter in also aren't FDA approved, so it's it's okay that they're not FDA approved. They're also not for internal use, though. Classically, no. they're <laughs> for largely external areas. But but it's like it's it might be harmless. It's also fucking pointless. It's pointless. There's yeah. no reason. But for they this. do say that. They do say you know it's totally pointless. Um, it is just a little fun product. I think but... it might be an effective contraceptive because I'm not sure I'd have sex with somebody <laughs> if they were glittery. <laughs> Yeah, no, you probably need to grow up a little bit first. Oh, they do also say, um, they do also say on their website that uh, if people have asked questions whether you can use them with condoms. Um, they said they've not distinctly tested this. They've not, it's it's not a test that's been done, but they, they reckon there's no reason why you couldn't use it with condoms. Oh, that's good enough then. But surely there's a grittiness to it that's going to erode the rubber of the condom. That's got to be a it, risk. I, I don't think it's a good idea to use something like that with, with condoms. With genitals. Or with well, common sense. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Number three are wild yam suppositories. Wild yam, as in the vegetable. Uh huh. Like a sweet potato. Uh huh. They're quite large. <laughs> it's in a suppository. Okay. It's, it's, it's popped I mean, that's into... what I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> an entire sweet potato. It, it's, it's an extract. Um. So as women get older, the change in hormones during the menopause can contribute to a condition called vaginal atrophy, where the skin gets a little bit drier, tighter, and possibly inflamed. Um, But not to worry, there are natural tips for dealing with that, including the use of herbal suppositories, um, some of which contain black cohosh and wild yam, which is apparently favourable for many since it uh, includes absolutely no hormones and chemicals. No, <laughs> no chemicals, chemicals. No chemicals. In yams. No chemicals at all. But that shouldn't still. That shouldn't be the the barrier to which I would need my suppositories. Are, are there any hormones in it? No. Well, fine. Give it. <laughs> shove just, it away, mate. Pop, Absolutely pop fine. It up there. I want a positive effect rather than just the lack of a negative. Effect. <laughs> um, but the two compounds apparently mimic estrogen. Um, they do warn that these suppositories can be a hard thing to get hold of. Um, the Livestrong website points out that although no comprehensive scientific research has been completed on wild yam uh, herbalists and naturopathic doctors have recommended it for hundreds of years for a variety of menstrual and vaginal symptoms so there's, there's two things that stand out to me there one is that you put these two things together to mimic estrogen a hormone so it's in all, yeah. no hormones we just try and get as close to a hormone yeah. as physically possible so that's already it's HRT without the H gotcha yeah it's just RT yeah. <laughs> you're, you're replacing nothing <laughs> with something with nothing which makes sense they also said that there's been no research done on wild yam yeah is that true? Has no one ever researched a wild yam? That seems like an omission in biology. One would imagine there's some kind of plant scientist somewhere who's had a good I look at I think they one. probably mean the effectivity oh, okay. of wild yam. Fair enough. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it's probably a big gap in the market. Um, yeah, so any plant biologists in here, get on it. Yeah. This is a growth industry right there. Fertile Maybe ground. it doesn't really exist. Maybe it's like a mythical... 
Planet. Like a unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can't oh, research something that doesn't exist. Yeah, all yams are def- going in captivity. There, is no, there are no wild yams. You try and let them out, they just sit there. <laughs> be, be free, yams, be free. And they're just not afraid. Because they're bred in captivity, they know no better. It's, it's tragic. It's really tragic. It's like grouse. <laughs> Um, number four is actual garlic. There are countless home remedies for treating yeast infections, including sticking frozen ice cubes of yogurt in the vagina. Um, but my favourite has to be shoving an actual clove of garlic up your yoni. Um, <laughs> this you also one... put like an onion, a bit of sage in the oven for the hours. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like encouraging you to be stuffing. <laughs> oh, You're being seasoned. It really is. It's seasoned. You're being seasoned. <laughs> Um, this one is actually based on a little bit of science Um, since the component of garlic called allicin it uh, has been shown to have some fungicidal properties so use it for yeast infections Um, but the only study that has looked at the application of garlic topically to the skin with an ointment didn't actually do any follow-up cultures to look at whether the infections persisted afterwards um, making it a totally pointless study. What a waste of time, yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, there's no reason to believe uh, it would make the slightest bit of difference, and it's near impossible to study. If allicin is a useful fungicide, we would extract it and measure it in, in and test it in measured doses. Sticking a, cl- a clove of garlic in your vagina is probably a waste of time. I think the fact that they didn't do those kind of follow-up uh, tests to see whether it was effective just says they just really wanted to shove some garlic up some yeah. people's vaginas. That's all. That, that, they're just more <laughs> looking for an excuse. Go for it. Um, and it is bound to leave your skin irritated and uncomfortable. And number... It stops you fucking vampires though, isn't it? It will that stop the vampires. That is true. Which is a big problem with Twilight fans. <laughs> <laughs> Less so Buffy fans, but a little bit. A little bit, a little bit. Um, And last, but uh, by no means least, um, is a treatment that might actually do something and not in a good way. Um, Apparently, there is a practice of women using wasp nests. What? (laughs) You're going to have to... uh, Yeah, a wasp nest. A wasp nest. How big is a wasp nest? It's bigger than a yam. It's... it's... (laughs) So we've now got uh, the, the unit of sugar is a caramel <laughs> and uh, things going into your, uh, your various orifices. Measured in yams. Yeah, measured in yams. <laughs> yams. It's about 3.2 yams. About three, 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 three yams. Yeah, three three yams. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. Um, so these are from gall wasps, so they have a much smaller nest. Um, oh, that's fine then. Fine. <laughs> crack, crack, crack on, ladies. Point eight of a yam. <laughs> <laughs> the gall wasp lays its eggs inside the bark of oak trees. Uh, which irritates the tree, um, causing it to release talin- tannins and gallic acids. Um, and the tree grows a little formation around the larvae. So it's a, a little, they call them um, oak nuts or um, oak galls. Oh, yes, I've seen apples. these things. I've seen these things, yeah. So they're just, they're just a little... A little uh, Basic, they're empty. They've obviously got no wasps yeah. in them, um, but they're just a little thing of, of a bit of tree, basically, that has had um, wasp larvae growing in it. Um, again, you can buy them on Etsy and Amazon. It's recommended that you boil up the oak galls and either eat them or grind them down into a paste and apply topically, uh, which isn't a great idea because it's an ast- it's got an astringent property, so it can dry out the skin. It can lead to stinging. It's not a good idea. Um, here's another one we can rely on the expertise of Dr. Jen Gunter because she wrote a blog post on this who points out that this astringency can damage the mucous membrane of the vagina which is important for protection uh, for the vagina's protection which can lead to a disruption in the bacteria present in the vagina and lead to infections but she also points out that if the mucous membrane is damaged um, you're more likely to catch HIV if you have sex with an infected partner um, because the the skin is much more likely to break and, and get damaged. And of course, there are no discernible uh, discernible benefits of all scientific evidence to support the use of wasp's nests. Um, so it's that's... funny how they spend a lot of time encouraging women to put things in them. Not a lot of stuff on cocks. I don't see a lot of stuff like, oh, rub this on your cock, it'll be grand. Next you time, I'm skeptics are okay. Are you going to do that? The next live show. I'll see, find out. 101 things to smear must, on your cock. It must exist. It must exist. I've not seen any sort of woo advice on things to rub your cock in. Mike? Not my field of expertise. <laughs> uh, so that's my, my like top five rundown of things you can put in your vagina. Um, but basically... If anyone tells you to put something in your vagina, think carefully. Natural isn't always better. Okay. I'm going to talk 
rap placebo effect. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the doll's there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I did a poll on Twitter. Who wants me to talk about the placebo effect? Ninety percent talk for the placebo effect. Very good. How many so if you're in the ten percent, fuck off. <laughs> we we do get occasional complaints that you're talking oh, about it too much. Yeah, but you know, fuck it. Marsh will be doing PR for fucking nine years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a few episodes ago, listeners might remember that I said I've pretty much covered all of the claims for the placebo effects that are referenced in Bad Science. Um, the thing about that word, pretty much. Um, is that it gave me enough wiggle room to keep back a couple of claims to tackle another day. So let's start with a claim from Bad Science. What the doctor can... What the doctor knows can affect treatment outcomes. The information leaks out in mannerisms, affect eyebrows and nervous smiles, as Grace Lee 1985 demonstrated with a truly ingenious experiment, although understanding it requires a tiny bit of concentration. We up for concentrating? Tiny bit? I think bit. that was literally a tiny bit. That was <laughs> the best that we got out of that was a tiny bit. Uh, this, is, this is still bad science. He took patients having their wisdom teeth removed and split them randomly into three treatment groups. They would either have salt water, a placebo, um, fentanyl, which is an excellent opiate painkiller, or naloxone, which I keep pronou- mispronouncing as naxalone, so if I fall over and spoonerize that, please forgive me. Naloxone, which is an opiate receptor blocker, which would actually increase pain. Aww. So... Um, what, what naloxone does is it blocks your endogenous opioids, which means when your brain is releasing opioids to try and help you cope with pain, it shuts those down, and so you actually feel the pain worse than you would have done otherwise. The endogenous ones are very different from the erogenous ones. He should have had a, a wing of the arm with erogenous <laughs> opioids in there. That was pretty good. In all cases, the doctors were blinded as to which of the three treatments they were giving to each patient. But Grace Lee was really studying the effect of the doctor's beliefs, and so the groups were further divided in half again. In the first group, the doctors given the treatment were told truthfully that they could be administering either placebo or naloxone or fentanyl. This group of doctors knew there was a chance that they were giving something that would reduce pain. In the second group, the doctors were lied to. They were told that they were either giving placebo or naloxone, two things which could only do nothing or actively make the pain worse. In fact, without the doctor's knowledge, some of their patients were actually getting the pain reliever fentanyl. As you would expect by now, just through manipulating what the doctors believed about the injection they were given, even though they were forbidden from vocalizing their beliefs to the patients, there was a significant difference uh, in outcome between the two groups. The first group experienced significantly less pain. So we're discussing this with my please welcome our special guest, Ben Goldacre. (laughs) Imagine, imagine, it'd be amazing. (laughs) So did everyone follow that? That's Ben's telling of this story, right? Um... The patients were split into three groups. They were given saline, fentanyl, or naloxone by a blinded physician. Within each of these three groups, there were two subgroups. One, uh, one that was a blinded physician who was told, we're not saying what you're giving the patient, but it is one of naloxone, saline, or fentanyl. And the other group, there was a blinded physician who was told, we're not saying what you're giving them, but it's one of naloxone or saline. So everyone with me so far? Yeah. Right. So, of course, I went out and I found the original paper. This paper was titled Clinicians' uh, Explanations Influence Placebo Analgesia. It was published in The Lancet in 1985. 60 patients took part in this study, I think, for reasons <laughs> that I'll come to in a second. Um, 60 that were then divided in three and divided in two. Uh, yes, There's but... There's not many people per group. A, a, it's, it's a little bit more gnarly than that. I um, think you find it's more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> So 60 patients, after having had their wisdom teeth removed, presumably for good medical reasons, not just for the bents. Oh, God, it'd be amazing if it wasn't that. (laughs) They just signed up to be part of a clinical trial. (laughs) Unlucky, mate. Yeah. Um, So uh, after having had their wisdom teeth removed, the patients filled out a self-reported questionnaire. Of course they did. That is the shittest catchphrase ever, Mike. It is. (laughs) (laughs) The patients filled out. Yeah, you know the You know the hits. (laughs) So they filled out a questionnaire. They filled it out twice, in fact. The first was 10 minutes before they received an intravenous injection of some intervention. Uh, The second was one hour after that intervention. The patients were, as Ben says, split into three groups. The first group consisted of 26 people. They received a saline injection. The second group, uh, which consisted of 16 people, um, they received the naloxone injection. And the final group, which consisted of 18 people, they received fentanyl. Now, those are some pretty weird group sizes. Mm. 26, 16, and 18. 
Now, Ben describes the group allocation as being random. He says literally split randomly into three groups. Actually, the paper does not mention that the groups were randomized. Uh, and despite the known lumpiness of randomization, the variation in these group sizes seems really, yeah. really big. Yeah. Um, which is, struck me as a little bit weird. Not only that, there was an additional group were 14 people who received no treatment. And that confused me as well, because when you add 26, 16, 18, and 14, you get to 72 patients, <laughs> not 60. <laughs> if you exclude the no treatment group, there's 60 patients. Is there? You had seven, oh, 74, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing the math wrong but Yeah. why say there are 60 patients, oh, and another 14... That we're just not going to count. That we're just not going to talk about. I don't understand why you would report it like that. Anyway, Bad Science says that these initial three groups were then split in half. Uh, quote, the groups were further divided in half again. That's actually not true. The sailing group was divided into two groups of 18 and 8, which is a long way from being divided in half. The naloxone group was split into two groups of 11 and 5, uh, and the fentanyl group wasn't split at all. This was a single group of 18 patients. Under no reading of this paper, can you describe this as the groups being halved? Mm -hmm. So that's my first point. The second point, bad science says that the doctors were lied to. It says that they were told that they were only giving placebo or naloxone when actually some of their patients were getting fentanyl. That's not true. That's not what the paper says. The doctors were not lied to like that. In fact, the paper talks about two groups, which they label PN and PNF. Uh, the doctors attending to the PN patients administered only placebo or naloxone to patients in that group. They knew they were administering only placebo or naloxone. They didn't know which, but they yeah. knew that those were the only two options. There was nobody in the PN group receiving fentanyl. There just wasn't there. Yeah. Doctors attending to the PNF uh, uh, group, they administered placebo, naloxone, or fentanyl, hence PNF, PNF. Um, they knew they were administering pl placebo, naloxone, or fentanyl. At no stage was any doctor told that they were not administering fentanyl. Well, in fact, they definitely were. Quite why bad science describes a totally fictional methodology for this study, especially having first instructed the reader to concentrate, <laughs> is a mystery to me. Concentrate, because what I'm describing bears no relation to the actual paper. Um, but so the results. Patients in the no-treatment group... We don't actually get their results reported, so we don't know anything about them at all. Their data is just not in the paper. They're mentioned. We're told there's 14 of them. That's it. Patients who received fentanyl, we don't get their results reported either. We're told there's 18 of them. We're told their doctors were blind to the intervention and knew the range of possible options, but we're not told what happened to them. Nothing about them at all. Same for the patients on the Loxone. 16 of them. No idea what happened. The data's Jesus. just not in the paper. <laughs> Except their teeth probably fucking hurt. But aside from that, <laughs> we've got no idea what happened to those people. The only data reported are the data for the patients who got the saline injection, the placebo. And that, is gro gr that data is presented, broken down by what their doctors were told. Okay. So patients getting placebo in the PN group reported a mean increase in their pain scores of six and a bit. Why six and a bit? Because the paper doesn't give numbers, it only gives a fucking chart. <laughs> so I, I've got no idea. Um, anyway, the, the placebo patients who doctors knew there was no painkiller, they reported an increase in pain, pain scores of six and a bit. Uh, this group, I should point out, consists of just eight patients. There are just it's, eight that's patients. That's the ones that the claim is being made on. Yeah. So the, what the doctor is told affects the outcome of the patient. It's that basically. entire thing is based on eight, eight patients. patients. Eight patients. Jesus. In the PNF group, patients reported a mean decrease in their pain, pain, pain scores of two and a bit. This group consisted of 18 patients, uh, which is still strange. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tiny group, but it's still double the size of the other group, <laughs> yeah. which, is, which is very peculiar. Um, in total, then, these conclusions are drawn from data on just 26 patients. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny study. Um, there are two things uh, worth wondering about here. One is why bad science mangles the description of this study so badly after having first directed readers to pay attention. I've no idea why that is the case. Second is why would the Lancet publish this weird, clumpy paper with half the data missing, no mention of randomization and hardly any patients? One clue to this, this might be the section of the paper that the, pub, that the uh, section of the journal that the paper was published in. This was a letter to the editor. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> 
which also means there is a very good shot that this was not actually peer-reviewed prior to publication because letters to the editor generally aren't, depending on the journal. So I went and checked the writer's guidelines for The Lancet. They say correspondence letters are not usually peer-reviewed. Now that as there's a little bit of wiggle room in there because those are the 2017 writer's guidelines and the guidelines in 1985 might have thoroughly enforced peer review on all letters sent to the editor. (laughs) Um, Presumably um, to the sound of a synth drum while wearing shoulder pads because it was 1985. Um, It also says um, that... uh, uh, the, the writer's guidelines say that letters are not usually peer-reviewed, which doesn't mean that they're never peer-reviewed, yeah. but it, there's a possibility. But let's be honest with ourselves. We would laugh in the face of a homeopath if they came to us with a study of this size, with no mention of randomization, most of the data mission missing, published as a letter to the editor. But when we're writing about the placebo effect, for some reason, this is just given a free pass. Well, that's it. I mean, the fact that this is mischaracterized, for one thing, is bad enough. But the fact that it's on aid patients, like I read somewhere, like I forget which book it was that told me uh, the things that you need to look out as red flags about a study. And I'm sure the things that you have to look out for was, is this peer reviewed or not? Is this a really small sample size? Oh yeah, the book was fucking bad science. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I learned how to check those facts about a thing. This, this, this is the entire paper. That's literally the, en- that's the entire paper. It's not even a full it's paper. A to the editor, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's half a page. Editor, it is literally so it just short, a letter but... to the editor. Wow. That's the paper. Um, so, yeah, placebo effect. Okay, so we should wrap the show up then so people can go and get their lunch. Um, so, all that remains then is for me to thank Marsh for coming along today. Thank you. And thank you to Alice. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who brought interesting foodstuffs for yeah, us to try at the time really recording. Cool. Round of applause for them. It was great. You think the theme tune's going to work on the laptop? No. No? No. We'll give it a go. Well, we've been Skeptics with a K, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. Bye. Skeptics with a K is a production of the Merseyside Skeptics Society. For more information, visit our website, www.merseysideskeptics.org.uk or email podcast at merseysideskeptics.org.uk. Skeptics with a K.